Of the approximately 440 nuclear power reactors currently operating worldwide, the vast majority are pressurized light water reactors, or PWRs, or boiling light water reactors, or BWRs, the remainder consisting mainly of can-do heavy water reactors and a handful of other designs. While their ubiquity and longevity would seem to indicate that PWRs and BWRs are the time-tested pinnacle of reactor design, the reality is somewhat different. Today's nuclear power landscape has less to do with technical capability than it does with politics and economics, and these two forces have led to many innovative, safer, and more capable reactor designs being relegated to the annals of history. In the early days of nuclear power, a great deal of research focused on breeder reactors, which generate more fuel than they consume. This is accomplished by bombarding non-fissile or fertile isotopes with neutrons from the reactor core, transmuting them into fissile isotopes which can then be burned in the reactor. For example, uranium-238 absorbs a neutron to become uranium-239, which undergoes two beta decays to become neptunium-239 and fissile plutonium-239. Similarly, thorium-232 absorbs a neutron to become thorium-233, which undergoes two beta decays to become palladium-233 and fissile uranium-233. The former process occurs naturally in most ordinary reactors, accounting for around one-third of the total energy generated. Dedicated breeder reactors, however, are designed to attain as high a breeding ratio, the ratio of fuel generated to fuel consumed, as possible. This is typically accomplished by surrounding the core with a blanket of fertile material, which does not participate in the main chain reaction, but absorbs neutrons to generate new fuel. The breeder cycle has numerous advantages over the conventional once-through-fuel cycle, chief among them being the ability to extract more energy from a given load of fuel. PWRs and BWRs typically extract only 1% of the total energy available in the fuel, whereas breeder reactors can theoretically extract from 60 to 99% of the available energy. Breeder reactors can also theoretically reduce the amount of long-lived radioactive waste produced through nuclear power generation. The waste products in spent nuclear fuel fall into two main categories, fission products, or fragments of fission nuclei, and transuranic, or actinide waste, consisting of heavier isotopes generated via neutron activation of the fuel. With a few exceptions, such as cesium-137, most fission products are short-lived and decay away to safe levels in under 100 years. Actinide wastes, however, are much longer-lived, requiring that spent fuel be safely stored for up to 10,000 years. By either burning actinides as fuel or splitting them into shorter-lived fission products, breeder reactors significantly reduce not only the total amount of waste, but also the length of time the waste must be stored. However, all of this comes with significant technical challenges. As with the exception of the thorium cycle, most breeder cycles are carried out using fast neutrons with energies above 2 mega electron volts, as opposed to the moderated thermal neutrons used in typical power reactors. This affects the reactor's design in three major ways. First, sustaining a chain reaction using fast neutrons requires more highly enriched fuel, with a uranium-235 or plutonium-239 content of 50% or higher. Second, ordinary coolants like water cannot be used, as these act as moderators and slow down the neutrons. Instead, most fast reactors use a liquid metal coolant, the most common alloy being a mixture of sodium and potassium which is liquid at room temperature and transparent to neutrons. This has safety advantages over water cooling, as unlike water, sodium potassium does not need to be pressurized to prevent it from boiling, allowing the cooling system to operate at ambient pressure and eliminating the danger of an explosive cooling line rupture. However, this advantage is offset somewhat by the fact that both sodium and potassium react violently with water, making a coolant leak in a fast reactor significantly more dangerous. Other, more benign metals can also be used, such as the lead-bismuth mixture used in the OK-550 and BM-40A reactors of the Soviet Alpha-class fast attack submarine. However, unlike sodium-potassium, lead-bismuth solidifies at room temperature, meaning that when powered down in harbor, the reactors had to be kept connected to a superheated steam plant to keep the coolant liquid. If the system failed, the coolant would solidify in the reactor, permanently disabling it. Other coolants which have been used in fast reactors include mercury, supercritical water, and helium. All these coolants are able to transfer heat more efficiently and sustain higher temperatures than light or heavy water, resulting in higher thermal efficiency. The third major design challenge inherent to fast reactors involves controlling the reaction. Thermal reactors take advantage of Doppler scattering and the negative thermal and void coefficients of the moderator to keep the chain reaction under control. 
but as fast reactors have no moderator, these mechanisms are not available. Fast reactors thus largely rely on the thermal expansion of the fuel to produce negative feedback, with gross control being achieved via retractable neutron-absorbing control rods as in a regular thermal reactor. However, some fast reactor designs use a system of movable neutron reflectors, which regulate the amount of neutron flux reflected back into the core. This design was mainly used in reactors intended for use in space, such as the Soviet BESS and Topaz reactors used on the Rorsat ocean surveillance satellite. Fast reactors are particularly suited to space applications as the lack of a moderator makes them significantly lighter and more compact than thermal reactors. A fourth challenge unrelated to the use of fast neutrons is the need to reprocess the fuel. Ideally, the newly bred fuel would be burned in situ, but this is not possible due to the accumulation of fission products, several of which, such as iodine and xenon-135, are powerful neutron absorbers. As the buildup of these neutron poisons gradually reduces the efficiency of the chain reaction, the fuel must at some point be removed so the fissile isotopes can be extracted and formed into new fuel elements. This greatly increases the complexity of the fuel cycle and reactor facility. The world's first fast neutron reactor, codenamed Clementine, was built at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, and first achieved criticality in 1946. Clementine was fueled by pure metallic plutonium-239 and cooled with liquid mercury with control being achieved by a sliding uranium neutron reflector. The name came from the folk song, Oh My Darling Clementine, and was a reference to the reactor being built in a canyon, and 49 being a common code name for plutonium during the Manhattan Project. Producing around 25 kilowatts of thermal power, Clementine successfully demonstrated a number of pioneering technologies, including fast neutron fission, reactor controlled via delayed neutrons, and electromagnetic pumping of the metallic coolant, and was used to determine the neutron cross-section of 41 elements. It also revealed that mercury was not an ideal coolant due to its toxicity, high vapor pressure, and high neutron cross-section. Following two fuel element ruptures, Clementine was shut down and dismantled in 1952. However, it was not until U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower's 1953 Atoms for Peace speech that fast breeder reactor research truly took off. The world's first pilot-scale breeder reactor, the Experimental Breeder Reactor, or EBR-1, was constructed in 1950 at the National Reactor Testing Station outside Arco, Idaho. Fueled by enriched uranium and cooled by liquid sodium-potassium, on December 20, 1951, EBR-1 achieved a historic milestone by generating enough electricity to power four 200-watt light bulbs. The reactor was later able to power its own building, well, in 1955, the neighboring Borax-3 experimental BWR became the first reactor to power an entire town when it was connected to Arco's power grid. It was not, however, the first reactor to supply power to a commercial grid, that feat having been achieved by the Soviet Obnisk nuclear power plant on June 27, 1954. The high power density and efficiency of fast neutron reactors made them attractive as naval propulsion units, so on July 21, 1955, USS Seawolf, the U.S. Navy's second nuclear submarine after the USS Nautilus, was launched with an experimental liquid metal-cooled submarine intermediate reactor aboard. Unfortunately, the reactor proved maintenance-intensive and prone to dangerous coolant leaks, and after only three years of operation, was replaced with a more conventional pressurized water unit. This setback did little to slow fast reactor development on land, however, and on December 2, 1957, the shipping port reactor, the world's first commercial breeder, achieved criticality in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Three power units would eventually be built at the site, the first two being fast seed and blanket breeders fueled by 93% uranium-235 and cooled by sodium-potassium, and the third being a thermal, water-cooled breeder fueled by uranium-233 with a fertile blanket of thorium-232. Over 25 years of operation, the shipping port reactors produced 7.4 billion kilowatt hours of electricity and achieved a small but concept-proving breeding ratio of 1.01. On July 12, 1957, the sodium reactor experiment at the Santa Susana Laboratory in California became the first U.S. reactor to produce electricity for a commercial grid when it was hooked up to the nearby city of Moore Park. Other countries soon followed suit, with the United Kingdom beginning construction on a prototype fast breeder reactor at Dunray, Scotland in 1955. The reactor first achieved criticality on November 14, 1959, and began producing electricity for the national grid in October 1962. 
In the same year as Dunre began construction, the Soviet Union demonstrated its first experimental fast breeder reactor, the BR-1, which achieved the highest recorded breeding ratio of 2.5. In the 1960s, the Soviet Navy would also pick up where the USS Seawolf left off, producing a series of lead bismuth-cooled fast reactors which were installed in the experimental submarine K-27 in 1962 and seven Alpha-class fast attack submarines starting in 1969. Bruder reactor technology was also enthusiastically pursued in France, which has few uranium reserves of its own. France's first experimental fast breeder reactor, Rhapsody, first achieved criticality in 1967 and was used to prove out designs and technologies for the prototype Phoenix reactor. Phoenix, which first began supplying electricity to the French power grid in 1973, generated 250 megawatts and achieved a breeding ratio of 1.16 and was itself a pilot plant for the larger 1,242-megawatt Super Phoenix reactor, completed in 1986. Germany also experimented with breeder reactors, constructing the 327-megawatt SNR-300 power plant outside Kalkar, North Rhine-Westphalia, between 1972 and 1986. However, shortly before the reactor was due to come online, the German government cancelled the project as a reaction to the Chernobyl disaster. The site was subsequently converted into an amusement park called Wunderland Kalkar. One of the last countries to develop breeder reactors was Japan, which constructed the experimental Joyo reactor in 1977 and the Monju commercial plant in 1995. Yet despite this early enthusiasm, by the 1970s it was becoming clear that breeder reactors had failed to live up to their initial promise. Most prove unreliable, maintenance-intensive, and prone to coolant leaks, leading to frequent fires such as at the Japanese Manju plant in 1995, or even partial meltdowns such as at EBR-1 in 1955, the sodium reactor experiment in 1959, and the Fermi-1 reactor in 1966. Such incidents led to many breeder reactors being shut down for long periods of time for maintenance and repairs, resulting in capacity factors as low as 7% for the French Super Phoenix. This in turn resulted in massive cost overruns, with the capital costs for most breeder reactors being at least 25% greater than for regular thermal reactors. The only country where breeder reactors have proven viable long term is Russia, which continues to operate the BN600 and BN800 sodium cooled reactors, which collectively supply 1,440 megawatts of electricity to the Middle Urals region. Even worse, the problem breeder reactors were intended to solve never materialized. In the 1950s, it was believed that global uranium reserves were limited and would quickly be depleted by a once-through fuel cycle. Breeder reactors, though more expensive to build and operate than thermal reactors, were expected to become economical once uranium prices began to rise. However, uranium reserves proved far more abundant than expected, and prices steadily dropped throughout the following decades, reaching an all-time low of $20 per pound in 1984. At the same time, major reactor manufacturers such as General Electric and Westinghouse realized it was more cost-effective to simply scale up the designs they had already developed for naval propulsion rather than design new civilian reactors from scratch. As research and development costs had already been subsidized by the government, these companies were able to sell PWRs and BWRs at a more competitive price than other designs. Another factor which worked against breeder reactors was the fear of nuclear proliferation. Though breeder cycles were designed to produce new nuclear fuel for civilian power generation, the plutonium-239 and uranium-233 extracted from the spent fuel could just as easily be used in nuclear weapons. These and other factors combined to negate the technical and economic advantages of breeder reactors and led to the nuclear market being dominated by conventional BWR and PWR designs. In recent years, concerns have been raised over the large amounts of long-lived nuclear waste generated by thermal reactors. While efforts are currently underway to construct long-term waste repositories like the Onkolo facility in Finland, this issue has also sparked a resurgence in research on breeder reactors as a potential solution. The desire to transition away from fossil fuels has also renewed interest in nuclear energy as a whole, resulting in the development of several innovative and promising nuclear reactor designs. Tune in next time as we take a look at some of these weird and wonderful reactors only on our own devices.